Good morning, Bethesda. Can we all stand up? We're going to start just standing. And can we make this declaration? Everybody say, I, I will bless the Lord. So you're making a declaration today that, that we're going to do what the Bible said. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I will sing of your goodness. I will sing of your love. Though the seasons come quickly, you have always been enough. Though the night may get darker, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love. that says the steadfast love of the Lord never fails. His mercies are new every morning. Come on, can you say his mercies are new every morning? Every day gets sweeter. Every day gets better. Every day gets sweeter. Every day gets better. You are good. You are Good in the morning, I'll sing you. Ah, oh, good in the evening, I'll sing you. Ah, oh, good, you are good to me. One more time. 
more time. You are good. You are good. In the morning I'll see you. You are good. In the evening I'll see you. You are good. You are good to me. here 
you will fill me today. <laughs> I want a fresh filling. I want a fresh filling. Fill me. overflow today. I don't want just a little bit. I want you to pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit. said if we ask we would receive so Lord we're humbly asking today for you to fill us come Holy Spirit come Holy Spirit we want you come Holy Spirit we need you This is how it started for Jesus. He walked to where John the Baptist was baptizing. John looked up and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And about that same time Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came and rested on Jesus. And even Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became empowered and equipped for what God had sent him to accomplish. You see, we need the Holy Spirit just like Jesus. And we need to ask Holy Spirit to come and rest upon us. You're all we want. You're all
also said, the Spirit of the Lord said, in the last days I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. You will be filled with the Spirit. So the Spirit of joy and peace and, and grace and euphoria is for us today. <laughs> so Lord, we yield, we lean into you. We thank you for filling me, filling us. I thank you for filling me. Why don't you just say, Lord, I thank you for filling me. I don't know what it may look like or feel like, but I ask you to fill me up. Fill me up, Jesus. Oh, just one taste, and you'll never want anything else. <laughs> taste and see that the Lord is good. 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 Come on, let's feast today. Taste and see. He's brought us to his banqueting table today taste and see that the Lord is good taste and see that the Lord is good sweet like honey on my lips sweet like honey on the thing about honey it's thick and it's sticky and it's gooey you know you got to kind of work on it when you get it on your lips you just kind of have to mm. Mm. just say it mm.
just extend your arms and say, come rest on me. You're all we want. You're all we want. I've got one response. I've got just one move. With my arms stretched wide, I will worship you. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart sing. Sing a hallelujah. 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 Come on, my soul. Hallelujah. Come on, my soul.
So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for All that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it's not much, but if nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. to Cameron, my son, he's like a wild and rowdy one. He wouldn't like play his music with children in the room. But a couple of weeks or a couple of months ago, he's gotten saved, delivered from all of his addictions. <laughs> and he's turned his life over to Jesus and he just made an album, uh, released a gospel album. And my son sent me a video and um, it was footage from back in the 50s and 60s when the Holy Spirit was moving and people were not afraid to uh, let the Holy Spirit do what he does. And the place, the, the church was covered with people 
dancing and shouting and falling out and acting a fool, you know. They looked really silly, but the Holy Spirit was there. I just thought it was really interesting about this artist that he made a video from that. Because you know what? When people really encounter God, they want the real. They don't want the counterfeit. They want the real gospel, the real Holy Spirit, the real thing that will set them free. And um, I don't know about you, but he set me free. <laughs> and so all I can do is throw up my hands and praise him again and again and again. And I, you know my testimony. A couple of months ago, Stephen was pushing me in the wheelchair to go to my doctor's appointments. But I'm jumping and dancing and leaping with praises to Jesus. And Joy, I want you to share your testimony about what happened to you at the healing rooms because we're just still like basking in that. Yesterday in the healing rooms, I was just walking and praying. Nobody had prayed for me. I was just praising God and worshiping. And I just, it dawned on me that nothing hurt. I had no pain in my body. And I was like, well, that's new. And so I've been, most of the day today, I have not felt any pain either. So I woke up not in pain. I went to bed not in pain. And yeah. God is good. Come on. Come on. But you, come on, how many of you had some real party days in the world and you were like all out? Yeah. So we got to be all out for Jesus. Right. <laughs> all out for Jesus because he's the biggest, best party around. Yes. And uh, we're just giving glory to God. Yes. And, you know, I say that about that video because we just want this atmosphere to be a place here that you can just be free to worship. You can be free to respond to what God is doing in your life. And I thank God that he's delivering, he's setting free our son. And I shared this testimony a couple of weeks ago at prayer meeting. He also called us one night and he said there was a, um, a man in the town, a little small town around here, and he was kind of known as a big troublemaker and town drunk, and he was just a mess. <laughs> How many of you have ever been a mess? Oh, come on now. Some of y'all are acting all religious and perfect, but I've been a mess, but I have a message. <laughs> My mess has been turned into a message. <laughs> but he said, um, so Cameron was getting a gas that afternoon, and the, the guy had not acted in a good way at one of their sporting events. He was acting crazy and being mean and making threats and stuff, and so he starts walking towards Cameron. You know, Cameron's like, all right, what's this guy here for? You know, I'm, I'm not going to let him mess with me kind of thing, you know? Strong cowboy. But the guy said, no, no, no. He said, I'm just, I'm coming because I'm going to ask you to forgive me. Please forgive me for being so mean to you. Please forgive me for stirring up problems at the eight-year-old baseball game. He said, I'm so sorry. He said, I really hit bottom. I lost everything. I lost my marriage. I lost my kids. He said, but my mom, she'd been praying me, praying for me for 40 years, and she never gave up on me. And he said, I went with her one day a couple of weeks ago to her crazy Pentecostal church. He said, but I gave my life to Jesus, and now I'm here waving the Christian flag at the local gas station. Is that, I mean, that's weird, you know. It's like I'm raising the Christian flag because I want to apologize and I want to let people know that my life has been changed, set free, and I'm not the same. Hallelujah. <laughs> so we here at Bethesda have an opportunity to rejoice in the harvest, which is on the heart of the Father. And we have an opportunity to make a safe space. You all know that's a term, right? A safe, God is the ultimate safe space. <laughs> he, was, he was a safe space before it was a term. <laughs> but this is an opportunity to be a safe space for us to get healed and filled and loved on and protected and set free and for Holy Spirit to speak to you and encounter you personally because he loves you so much. And he loves this world so much. He loves our community. He's for us. Like the 
Bible says he's for us, and if God be for us, who can be against us? It doesn't matter who's against us. God, Lord Sabaoth, the host of heaven is for us. reject anyone he paid far too much by giving his life you see the Bible says that God demonstrated his love he didn't just talk the talk but he walked the walk by sending his son and Jesus gave his life and died and poured out his blood and died on Calvary and he said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men. That means his plan was not to judge us. But his plan was to save us. To help us. And to love us with unconditional love. Can you just wave your hand and thank you? Say thank you, Lord, for unconditional love. Oh, he loves me. Jesus loves me. It's true. Jesus loves me. This I know. Jesus loves me. And how can I respond to the love that you have lavished on me? How can I respond? the love that you have lavished on me I don't have much I don't have much but I have a heart that beats for you I have a heart that beats for you I don't have much because I'm living for you I don't have much, but I have a heart that beats for you. I have a heart that beats for you. Every surrender every part of our life wants to love you like you love me I'm not gonna hold any part back from you every part of me come into my heart fill me up wants to love you like you love I don't have much, but I am. 
I was seven years old, I walked down the aisle of a Baptist church in Virginia with this song. All to Jesus I surrender. Spirit is tugging at hearts right now. Some of you are watching online and you don't even know what's going on because the Holy Spirit has invaded your space. He's coming after you right now. He wants you so much. Just surrender all to Jesus. preaching today on the power of humility. Humility and yieldedness work together. They that humble themselves will be exalted. <laughs> Worship is really a, an act of humility. It's setting aside all that we are and all that we've accomplished and recognizing the one who has done so much. To cry out and declare you are worthy of my allegiance. I pledge allegiance to you, Jesus. You gave your all, and now I'm living my life with all of my might. I want to do what Jesus said is the greatest commandment of all. I want to love you with my heart, all of my heart, all of my soul, and all of my strength. And you know, this is a big one, all of my mind. Because that's where the battle is most of the time for your attention to distract you and pull you away to miss the moment the opportunity that God has because we need to have encounters with him amen when you walk into the room everything changes and he is here I'm not the only one that feels his presence today. Amen. He is here. You are here. You are here. You are here. You are here. You have walked into this room and we feel your presence. Everything changed. 
changes. So if you've had a, a difficult, maybe a report that came that is not so exciting or interesting, we're praying for several people that have diagnosis of cancer, sickness and disease. Jesus, we want your presence. Because when you walk in, you bring healing. Ah, you bring peace. You bring strength. Come on, my soul. Come on, my soul. It's time to bless the Lord. Come on, my soul. Come on, my soul. You see, that's what David meant when he said, bless the Lord. He was saying, come on, soul. Why so downcast? Come on, my soul. Why so downcast, oh my soul? Come on, my soul. You gotta put your trust in God. Come on, my soul. Come on, my soul. Come on, my soul. Come on, put on faith. Come on, my soul. Put on hope. Come on, my soul. Put on love. Come on, my soul. Hey. Come on, my soul. From the top of my head. To the bottom of my soul. Come on, my soul. Every cell in my body saying, I bless you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I love you, Lord. With my soul, with my strength, with my mind, with my heart. With my soul, with my strength, with my mind, with all of my heart. With my soul, on, with my, my strength, soul. with my mind, on, with my all soul. of my heart. Come on, my soul. 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 I just had a funny memory. We had a family that's real close to me, friends, that they visited Bethesda. <laughs> this is many years ago. They were coming from a more traditional church, but it was a, a Pentecostal spirit-filled church. And they were coming to church, and right before we started, he said, by the way, is this one of those churches that likes to sing the same things over and over and over again? And I knew if I told him we were, he wasn't going to be that thrilled. I said, actually, we are. Come on, my soul. Come on, my soul. Come on, my soul. Come on, you got to stir yourself up in the Holy Ghost today. Stir yourself up. Come on, my soul. 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 Your love for others is going to exponentially grow. He loves you so much. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. been waiting for this song and I think we're ready for it it's such a big request when you ask actually from the depths and the sincerity of your heart 
are ready to say, God, show me your glory. I mean, it's, it's kind of intimidating. When Moses asked, God passed before him and he covered his eyes. But now we can behold him. We can look full into his beautiful, glorious face. your eyes and say, Lord, open my spiritual eyes to see your glory. depths of your glory. We want to know how wide your glory is.
said just to close your eyes and ask the Lord to let you see what is happening. I saw Jesus just going around the room and you know the scripture in Isaiah I believe it says take a coal, cleanse my lips, here I am. A piece of coal to cleanse. It's, it's a picture of cleansing but, but what I saw Jesus is he had a shape of a coal but it was it was this might be a little gruesome, but it was his blood that he had shed when he died for us. And I saw him just giving us a blood bath and just taking that sponge and just squeezing it and the blood just covering us from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, cleansing and washing us of all unrighteousness, of all sin, of all effects of sin anxiety and strife and anger and loss of the will to live and on and on the, the tactics of the enemy and as Jesus was going around doing that I also saw just so many angels like hundreds of angels just worshiping with us today in the room but what I just saw is I don't know if it was one of those angels or a different angel but I saw an angel at the door outside and he was holding a trumpet and he was blowing the trumpet and he was blowing the trumpet to awaken awake 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 Awake, 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 for it is the time of my bride. It is the time for my bride to arise. It is the time for my harvesters to go out. Awake, 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 awake. The angels are blowing the trumpets to say, awake, awake, awake. The ministering angels are warring and fighting and coming alongside of us. And the king of the host of heavens is walking in the room. There's a train that's filling the temple. It's filling this place with his glory. And all the angels and all the people of God are crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. But the angels are saying, Awake, 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 awake. Awake, awake, awake. The time is coming. The time is at hand. It's getting late. It's getting late. It's time to awake. It's time to wake up. It's time to arise, my bride. It's time to arise, my bride. And go forth, and go forth, and go forth as my army, and go forth as my army, and go forth in the name of the Lord. Moses said, show me your glory. He said, but you got to go with me. You're all I want. You're all I need. Show me your
cries out today. My flesh cries out. Show me your glory. Show. just endorse what we want, but we surrender to his presence and we pledge to do his will. We have, we've been bought with a price, Lord, so I'm going to give my life back to you. You purchased me with your blood. To you be glory and dominion forever and ever Amen. The book of Revelation says, Now unto him who loved us and washed us in his, and saved us and washed us in his blood. That's what the Lord has done for us. Amen. And that's what we need to remember on a regular basis because the enemy would love us to forget all that God has done. Because when we forget what he has done, we won't ask him to do it again. We won't remember his great power. And we'll never summon that power and cry out, Arise, God, arise. Give us the nations. Give us the nations. So arise, God, and let your enemies be scattered. One of the things I see in worship is that God begins to rise up in his strength and in his power. He begins to move in the direction of those that are worshiping and calling and honoring his name. He begins to hear the cries and the prayers of his people. And he doesn't turn a deaf ear. He hears and he heals our land. Amen. You want to know what I believe the hope of our nation is? It's not in the Republican Party. It's not in the Democratic Party. It's not in any one particular candidate. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. And remembering as a nation so many years ago, over 200 years ago, that our forefathers came to this land and God through His providence established a nation of nations. And over that nation, God declared that we were his people, his nation. One nation under God is our motto. We've forgotten that in so many ways. It's still written on our currency, but God wants to write it on our hearts again. Amen. That we would be a people that say in God we trust. One nation under God that will not be divided as the enemy has divided us. The scriptures declare that anything or anyone that walks in division cannot stand. A house divided cannot stand. Amen. I want you guys to realize in the glory of this moment that you have been called for such a time as this. It's not age specific. Every age in this room from our youngest children that are 5 and 6 and 8 and 10, to our elders, myself being one of them, in our 60s, 70s, and beyond. We've all been called. None of us are on the bench. None of us have retired from ministry. But we have been enlisted to be able ministers 
of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Yesterday was a glorious day, and we might have some, some uh, you could go ahead and stop. Thank you, worship team. What, a, what an amazing time in the glory and in the presence of the Lord. Wow, 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 wow. Billy Ray, you were on fire on the drums today. Thank you so much. The Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And uh, we're trying to utilize everything we can to give him glory and praise, right? Lauren, you did so amazing on that big bass guitar. I think if you put the bass guitar and stood it down on its edge, it'd be taller than you are. And it's just amazing to have you playing. My heart is filled with gratitude today. We sang that song, Gratitude. And uh, I feel so grateful for what God is doing here. And it's all because God has chosen to use us. I said God has chosen to use us. So the response, the opportunity we have on a day-by-day -day basis is to make ourselves available. That's really it. He'll qualify you. He'll give you what to say. He'll order your steps and lead you and have those divine appointments that you'll meet people like, wow, that was so amazing that I ran into so-and-so or had the opportunity to talk to somebody. What I was going to tell you is that yesterday we had an amazing time in the healing rooms. But after that, immediately, uh, Camilla and I went up to Golden, uh, Texas, for a funeral. And this was a, this was a tough funeral. Uh, Janet, who is a part of our church, her son was shot and killed. And uh, in the prime of his life with small children, it was just really heartbreaking. But I had the opportunity to share the gospel. Remember the word gospel means good news. And it's always relevant, even at funerals. Even when hearts are broken, the gospel can penetrate and comfort the brokenhearted, can comfort those that don't know how they're going to make it through. I held this beautiful little five-year-old girl that was the daughter of Corey who had been killed. And I just hold her in my arms, and, and Camilla loved on her, and she just lit up. She said, I, I, I took her to the grave where she and her mother and her and the mother of Corey. So the wife, the daughter, and the mother of Corey were all there. And we put the dirt in the ground. And my heart was so touched when this five-year-old said, Goodbye, Daddy. What an opportunity to look into the eyes of a five-year-old and say, Jesus loves you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to be with your brothers and sisters because he loves you. Later, she grabbed and tugged on me, and she said, you're my prince. <laughs> and Camilla said, what? <laughs> she said, my prince, charming. Then she looked at Camilla, and she said, and you're pretty. <laughs> I tell you, love never fails. I'm actually going to preach on 1 Corinthians chapter 13 next week. The Lord just really put it in my heart. And out of my love for you, I decided not to do it all today. <laughs> We're going to have a baptismal service after church. I'm so excited. Jim and Heidi got married a couple of months ago. How long have you been married now? Almost a year. No way. That's crazy. Wow, a lot's happened. You guys got a house and your whole, well, not maybe not your whole, but so many of your family are here to rejoice with Jim. Jim loves the Lord. And it was really exciting when he came and said, you know, I really want to be baptized. So I'm going to invite everyone at the end of this service. I mentioned we would do it inside, but I didn't realize that the baptismal trough that we have can't be drained except just to unplug it and so we're doing it outside so that when we have to drain it, it won't be on the carpet. 
Uh, so, but we've got a beautiful day. I told Jim we've added extra ice to the water to make it super cold. Not really, we've done the opposite. We've added warmth to the water. But not only Jim, anyone else. Is there anyone here that has prayed about it and you wanted to be baptized today? Some of the children, if you do, you talk to your dad and uh, we'll get some towels and we'll baptize you. We would love to do that. Before the baptismal, I'm going to take just a few minutes to explain why we're baptized, because we love Jesus and we're following Jesus, and what is happening when we're baptized, what's actually happening. But the Bible does say to every believer that we should be baptized to follow Jesus. Do you remember that song? Maybe some of you remember it. The, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. I think that's a great song for baptism, that this is the end of my old life. I'm going down in the water, being buried with Christ. I'm coming up out of the water, being resurrected to a new life in Jesus. Amen? I'm so happy that I was baptized when I was young, and it, it's still with me today. I still ask for fresh baptisms every day to be immersed in the love of God. Amen? Praise the Lord. Camilla, I bet you have some announcements, but I'm going to let you come do that after we do some testimonies. Why don't we do that now? I have been thinking about this and praying about this, and today my prayers have been answered. Lord, bring us the beautiful children in that we can just love on and be with because these kids make such a difference to this church family. Aren't we happy to have our children with us today? John, thank you for bringing your family. We're happy to have the little ones too, like Jasper's in the back. Hey, Jasper, we love you, little man. We love you, little guy. And uh, we love children. Can you all be in agreement? Really, one of my deepest requests right now, hi, Ella and uh, Caleb, we love you guys too. One of my deepest request to the Lord is to fill this church with families that have children and teenagers. I want all the mess. I want all the problems. I want the expense. Come on. Here's what the Bible says. It's where there are no oxen, the stables are clean. Look around. We got an immaculately clean church. I want some messes. I want kids running through with chocolate in their hands. I want barefooted kids to walk in from the playground and get the carpet messed up. I want Justin to come in on a Tuesday and say, man, who's been walking through here? Amen. But more than anything, I want to hear the words of Jesus fresh in my heart. Suffer the little children to come to me. I want these kids to have every advantage as they grow up in this world, in the days that we live in, that they have a God that loves them. And Jesus is their Lord and their Savior and their closest friend and their protector and their helper and their shepherd and their healer. And to have a revelation of who they are, that no weapon formed against our children will prosper, that the world can't take them. The world can't have them, that they're going to live for Jesus. And I also want to just declare, I believe the generation that is alive today, these children are going to be a generation that ushers in the awakening and the move of God that God is bringing to planet Earth. So I want to be a part of fathering, mentoring, encouraging, equipping, and supporting all of these kids. Yeah. Am I going to do that right now? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm getting ready to do that. Pastor Camilla, quit bossing me around. <laughs> Wendy, are you taking them out? Wendy's going to meet the children at the back door. Why don't we give our, our, our children a great big God bless you. <laughs> Quentin is helping today. And you got the A-team kids. You got the funnest teachers. Actually, all of our teachers are amazing. And I want to just put this little, little blurb, blurb out. We need more volunteers to help with children. I want to just echo the words of Pastor Bill Johnson. If you really want to minister to the heart of God, serve in the children's ministry. That's what God loves. God loves it when we 
love on the kids. Amen? So if you're not, anybody here willing and interested in maybe becoming a volunteer to help with kids that's not already? Would you do that kind of thing? That's awesome. Well, if you, if you are, make sure you see Camilla and talk to her because we'd like to get you involved. One thing we do for safety reasons is we have the background checks. Every church is supposed to do that. Don't let that scare you away. It's just something we do to make sure that our kids are safe. Um, all right. So I'm going to just go ahead. I want to do some testimonies if we have them. Uh, anybody that was in the healing room, you heard Joy already. Uh, I looked around and Joy told me, uh, she said, I don't have any pain at all. And she was walking around, kicking and stomping and jumping. Um, Justin, where are you? Why don't you come here for just a second? Uh, we had a few visitors, but we had a lot of our own that we just prayed. So I'm going to give the first testimony. It was my first time to be prayed for. Last, last month, I didn't get to go in and be prayed for. But I had a team that prayed for me. Joy was the leader of that team. Cecilia, and I don't want to forget, Keith. Thank you, Keith. I was so enjoyed. I said that. And Teresa, I don't know if they're here today. But uh, I was so encouraged. I just felt stronger and felt loved and felt uh, that those prayers were making a huge difference. It's like, here's what I thought. Camilla does a lot of things that are uh, holistic, I think is the right word. Um, and one of the things she has done, my little brother, he's really not my brother, but he was in my youth group back in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now he's a PhD, he's a doctor, and he has uh, done some things for Camilla that are kind of cutting edge. He put all the little nodes, nodes, is that what they're called, on her head. And she looked like she was a robot. She had all those things all over her head, and it was therapy. It was therapy, and it was doing something. The frequencies and the stuff, I don't understand it. I was watching the screen, and he was explaining to me what was going on, and Camilla had all that stuff on her head. It was kind of funny. I wanted to make fun of her, but I didn't. What wasn't funny is how expensive it was. That was not funny. But I said to Camilla, do you feel better? And she said, yes, I feel there's something happening. Well, that's exactly how I felt when hands were being laid on me yesterday. I, I had my eyes closed. Somebody put the hand on my head and somebody touched my side. Teresa started praying for my back. My back's been kind of bothering me. I've been doing a lot of lifting and moving. And, and she lifted put her hands on my back and she just said I just declare no more pain in your back at all and I didn't have any pain from that moment till this moment in my back amen, amen. so I just thank God I'm a believer and I appreciate the scripture says that we we can lay our hands on the sick and they will recover I don't know which mic I'm talking into I'm going to talk into this one I'm almost there I'm going to give this to you. This isn't even on. I'm holding it up, and it's not even on. But it's on for you. I was going to say, I can get you the anointing oil bottle. You led, you led one of the teams. Yes. And we won't have to say the name, but, sure. a, young, but a young lady came in. Yes. Um, and she actually saw it online is how she, or through social media. And she came in, and she was really struggling with uh, heaviness. She talked about it, fatigue and then even depression. And, and something that just jumped out at me was like, life's not worth living. Mm. And that hit me because I, I understand, um, I can empathize with that because last year, at this point last year, I was at the lowest point spiritually, emotionally that I'd ever been. And I told pastor, I said, if it wasn't for my faith in the Lord, I could easily see how somebody wouldn't want to go on if all they could see was pain, depression, and heartache. And we began to pray. I had Lakeisha. I had uh, Melinda was with us. And uh, who else was with me? I just, oh, yes. The Barbara was with us. Yes. I, several teams. So We had a great group. We, of we did. We had an amazing team. So we began to just release life over her and speak into her, you know, taking authority over those things that are oppressing her, the, the spirits. Now, we didn't 
just come out and say that over her. But, you know, we're just taking authority over depression, over fatigue, and, and said, you know, we just spoke energy and life into her. And I will never forget when I said, you have purpose, you have value, and she just broke. Mm. I mean, it was just like she had needed to hear that from the Father. And it was the, it was the love of the Father that was just coming in and comforting her. And I think later Joy got to speak to her afterwards. And uh, I know that she felt lighter. She did feel, she said when she, she was still, I don't think 100%, but she felt a lot better than when she first came in. And I just, we just released the love of God, the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. And we spoke life over her. And I'm telling you, the presence of God was so strong in that room. Um, and even before that, we had a chance to pray for somebody who was blind. That's and right. that, that was awesome. And I'm expecting right. any day to hear that he can see. Amen. I, I really do. I am full confidence. Jesus came to set the captives free, to heal the sick, to sit, let the blind see and the deaf hear. So we're going to see blind eyes open. We're going to see deaf ears pop open. We're going to see limbs grow out. I believe that. And the dead raised in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you. That same person you're talking about uh, is a friend of Jerry and Jerry brought him and, and uh, kind of helped him in. We found out after he's prayed for, he lingered to worship because the whole outer room is a time of worship, just inviting the glory, the presence of God. And many of you are a big part of that as we worship. Then we take them into the side. We had uh, so many to finish up in the two hours that Camilla went ahead and we had three different uh, areas where we were praying for people. And it made me re remember the pool of Bethesda that when you read the description, there were five different porches that the people were gathered and waiting for the water to stir, to stir. So we had three that we were praying for. And this particular gentleman, after he'd been prayed for, he stayed and I was watching him. He was really receiving. But we heard that when he went back to his car, he had another seizure. So we just began to pray. and Jerry ministered to him. Jerry came in this morning and we just agreed because we believe healing started and we, we're going to pray that that process will be complete. Amen. Amen? So Jerry and I just agreed that that seizure is, is, this, is the, the cycle of seizures is ending in his life. That he sees an end to the seizures and the blindness and the, the, the things that the enemy has brought in his life. You know, G I'm doing it again. <laughs> Jesus, why don't you take this for me? I'll give it to you. Jesus. Jesus said when they asked him, or when it was described of Jesus, the reason the Son of God appeared. Do you know why? In the book of, I think, 1 John, and John was one of his closest disciples. He was in the inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. John was with him on the mountain when he was transfigured before them into the glory of probably what he is in heaven of light and splendor and magnificence. It was so good, they said, can't we just stay here? But John saw all that. And then John writes his letter and he said, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Amen. And the reason that we have healing rooms is we want to partner with Jesus to destroy what the devil has done, the havoc and the destruction that he has caused in lives of so many, believers and pre-believers. It's the goodness of God that brings us to repentance. Jesus, that was one of his methods. Before he even taught them, many times he would heal them, and then out of his goodness and out of the miracle and the healing that they received, they listened and they accepted and they followed Jesus. Amen. That's our heart. I was a proud papa yesterday when I walked up and the signs were out. Knowing that the city of Lindale was having a significant uh, annual meeting, the Country Fest. Uh, I think they are estimating almost 20,000 people here in Lindale at that event. And guess where they were driving? Up and down this highway. I said to our team, as Camilla was starting us off and giving us some instruction, I stepped up and I said, and listen, this healing room is not limited to this four, these four walls. 
We're asking that as we pray, we're going to release healing to every car and every person and every family that drives up and down this corridor. Did you know that this corridor of 69 at I-20 and 69 is one of the busiest, most trafficked corridors in all the state of Texas? Thousands and thousands and thousands of cars driving by, seeing these signs, healing rooms today, open. Amen? Amen. So we're going to believe for many more to come in, but we're not just waiting for them to come to us. There's healing in your hands, and we're going to go out, and we're going to pray for them. Amen? Amen. We're going to bring them, just like Jerry brought that gentleman. Many of you are going to start bringing neighbors and friends and family members that need healing. Amen? Amen. Woo! All right, Camille, I'm going to take the offering now, and you can just do what you want to do before I preach. And that's, that's a little dangerous, but you go ahead and do it. Come on, ushers. Anybody here for the first time today? We got some family, family members, first timers. Okay, I don't see any hands. Guys, there's a scripture that I'm just wanted to just give you. Um, Jesus said, I think it's in the Gospel of Luke. He was talking to his disciples. So remember, in the context, he was just talking to a few people, maybe 12, maybe a few more in the overflow that followed him. Many of the ladies were there, if you didn't know that. But Jesus is there, and he said, It is my great privilege to give you the keys to the kingdom. I want you to know who you are and what Jesus is offering us as a church and as believers, that we can reign and rule and serve and give and love with him. Amen? That we don't have to be afraid. We're not on the defensive. We're riding We're taking back what the enemy has stolen. We're getting into a position of faith, a position of confidence and trust in God. And yet, in the midst of it, we are dependent and completely relying on the power of his Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. Amen? So I'm encouraging you to continue to give. One way the enemy tries to shut down churches and tries to shut down this church is through the lack of resources. And when we're small, many times some of us have to rise up and give big. But God will reward you. Just obey the Lord. I'm never going to manipulate or coerce you. But I want you to know we're behind two payrolls now. So your pastors are not being paid. I just want to tell you that because God is our provider and we're going to make it. But I've got two two houses. (laughs) One is getting ready to sell and we're praying for that to happen. Will you agree that our house will sell? will sell in Jesus' name. I'm not panicking. One thing that God's done in me, I just started realizing it recently. God, normally at a situation like this, I'd be getting pretty nervous and pretty, you know, whatever. Stressed, thank you. And Camilla's lived with me. But I have a peace and I have a confidence in the Lord. So would you agree? You're going to do your part. Amen? I have such confidence in you. You guys are going to do what God tells you to do. But, Lord, we thank you for bringing increase to this church. Can you all just agree that God will bring increase? There will be resources and offerings that come in that are going to help this church accomplish everything you want us to do. God, you've put it in our heart to love this city, to love families. You've put it in our heart to go to the nations and to support our missionaries. You've put it in our heart to give. To, to, to give benevolently, caring and helping people in need. So, Lord, I thank you that you will supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. And I thank you, Lord, that you will supply the need of every giver today, that as we give out of what we've earned, that you will make it up, multiply it, and bring your blessing over our finances. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask and we believe. Amen and amen. Amen. Stephen and I want to just say that we appreciate all of you so much. Um, God is raising up and has raised up an amazing team 
here at Bethesda. You are a part of that as, as much as you, you know, want to be. Um, we are all about the activation of believers. And right now, um, I believe we are in a season of, a, of getting ready for a divine setup. Um, we're getting ready for a divine setup. We love to host the presence of God. We love God and we love one another. We love people and we love the harvest. And um, the Lord is, has been building and is continuing to build a container for his presence, um, not just in each one of us, because every believer, we individually are a container, but we collectively, corporately are a container. And we are a container for the glory of God for our city, our region, our state, and even our nation and the nations of the world. Um, we continue to support our missions and our missionaries, and we do that every month faithfully. So we also just let you know you can give above and beyond that you can support our missionaries. I want to ask you to pray for Marisha, who's in Germany. Um, she's having a third surgery um, um, tomorrow, or end up being today, later today on our time. But we, can we just agree and pray for her for yes. just real healing now she's been dealing with this and um, not unable uh, very um, limited in her walking for the last year and i know that this is just an attack of the enemy against her against her uh, life and destiny so we're praying for her but we're continuing to support her so i want you to know that we don't stop supporting people whenever they're down <laughs> or they're not active um, but we're sticking with her and we're believing for full recovery in her body. So, um, but yeah, Stephen and I do, we thank you. I know for a church our size, we have a lot going on. We have a lot going on in a month. And many of you, um, not only are you full-time in your jobs and your life and your families, but you're full-time here. And we just appreciate you um, being a part of this because you are part of the container that the Lord is building I believe, to receive the harvest. Many, many um, glory pools are being built across this nation to receive and to um, minister first to the Lord and to receive the harvest. Amen? So I'm going to go quickly over this. Tomorrow night we will have our conference call, our prayer. We continue to pray together. It's a great way to, to connect and pray. Um, uh, this weekend is the conference, the Global Congress of Prayer in Washington, D.C. There is a link. If you receive our weekly emails and you want to be a part of that, you can click on that link. It's an Eventbrite link where you sign up, and this will be a Zoom conference. Great conference, speakers all over the world. Our worship session went wonderful Wednesday night. Many of you were here to just worship along with us and create that atmosphere of breakthrough. And uh, Stephen and I are also speaking at that conference. So it's just going to be a great um, international conference for prayer and worship and what God is doing. Um, we've let you know that we're continuing to have our prayer gatherings Tuesday morning, Wednesday night, Thursday morning. Lots of opportunity to pray and intercede for our nation and what God is doing. Wednesday night, join us in the hub at 6 p.m. For fellowship, we're having good fellowship together before we go to prayer at 7. Um, later this month, we are going to be having our Friday night fire. This will be da -da -da -da, October 28th, Friday night. This is going to be our last one for the year, and uh, we'll take off through the holiday season. So I just want to uh, invite you and encourage you. I know that um, we are just excited about what God is doing with our fire, with releasing the fire, revival fire, and we all we always know God's going to do something exciting and together. So I say that he's doing this because I realize that, um, you know, to make times to come to these meetings, it takes the effort and it takes the commitment, and we just bless you for that because, again, you are a part of building the container for the glory of God. So we bless you today. Boy, I really like that, Camilla, the container, or you said the glory pool. Woo, I'm jumping in, I'm jumping in. You know, many years ago, they had the revelation of getting on the glory train. Well, now we're getting a revelation on jumping in the glory pool, amen. 
The pool of Bethesda is a glory pool. Uh, I just had a, just a prophetic encouragement for you, Helen. I felt like the Lord said he's going to give you double for your trouble. <laughs> you are anointed. And the Lord's already been speaking to me as we move into uh, the season of what God is doing. That there's a mantle on you to teach. And uh, you have so much that the Lord has put in you. That he is going to draw things out of you that we've not yet accessed. So I just want to encourage you. I know you're deep. Just being around you, I'm always encouraged with the grace and wisdom that you walk in. But get ready. God's going to utilize you. And I, I just want to declare over you a mother, a mother to the harvest. I just believe you're an equipper, and God is going to use you. You're going to mentor and equip many, 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 men and women, in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't that good? Phoenicia, I just want you to know God really loves you. You are a delight to him. I, if we, I want to create a new award for Bethesda. It's the most elegant award. And I want to just deliver that to you. You walk in elegance and beauty. We love you very much. All right. Um, ha, I love the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, one thing I could say that I learned from my father-in-law, this is Camilla's dad. I love him like a father. And, and at the same time, we even speak to each other like we're brothers because we were so connected. One time, many years ago, uh, we were working with Church on the Rock, and the president of that organization uh, said to me, he said, you know, you and Pastor Jerry have something called synergy. I, I hate to tell you this, but at the time, I really didn't know totally what that meant. And religiously, I thought it had something to do with sin. <laughs> like, what are you saying? Is something wrong? We got synergy. But if you don't know, synergy is when you're stronger together. Kind of like a marriage, Jim. You and Heidi have synergy. Camilla and I have synergy. I'm stronger with her. And that's what the Lord did. So for 22 years, I served and worked together with my pastor, my father-in-law, my spiritual brother. And we served the Lord together. And uh, he would preach. Now, as his associate pastor, he's a lot different now. He's changed a lot. But back in the day, I only preached one Sunday morning a year. Because he was committed as the pastor to always be in the pulpit. Now, he's changed a lot. And he's, he's doing what, what I'm also trying to do is to, to bring in many voices as the anointing comes. To have an apostolic atmosphere to hear from the different ones that God is speaking through. Like Don Crum. Come on. Don Crum. And, and our great, great friend that now lives in Tennessee, Shirley Arnold. How many of you remember Shirley? How much we love her. And then Marisha. You mentioned Marisha. Uh, we're, we're not, listen, we're never late on supporting our missionaries. We support our missionaries. And we're not behind on any bills. So don't anybody think that we're in any jeopardy here. The Lord is faithful. Okay? So I just want to praise the Lord that one thing that I learned from Pastor Jerry, my father-in-law, is when the Holy Spirit would move and he had a great message, he didn't get nervous. He'd say, I'm just going to say what I'm going to say and put a semicolon and we'll just carry on. So that's what I'm going to do and trust that what the Lord has given me to say today, that we'll say exactly what we're supposed to say and then we're going to march out and have such a great rejoicing time with Jim and maybe some of the children getting baptized. Amen? Thomas, it's great to see you, and thank you for helping us. We still have security, and many of you serve to just watch the halls to keep our church and children safe. So thank you for, for doing that. Lord, 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 we love you. And I thank you 
Oh, as you spoke to my heart, woke me up and called me out of bed at 2 in the morning to just begin to download these scriptures and these thoughts. Let it just come alive and let our hearts hear your voice. Let us hear your heart. Let us humble ourselves today so that we can be so powerful and utilized for your kingdom and your glory. We seek to serve you and we live to please you. I want to honor you in all of my ways. And everybody say amen. I want to start with uh, my title, God Gives Grace to the Humble. Amen. I told you, keep, keep that up, just keep that title up for a little bit. I told you a few weeks ago and I read a, a prophetic word from Brian Simmons that one of the things that God is going to highlight in this present move of God is he is going to reinforce the value and the importance of humility in our lives. God has been teaching us and edifying us and building us up as a church and as a people and as individuals. And many times when the pendulum swings to a, a message of who you are in Christ and your identity in the Lord, many times the way the enemy will come in to try to interrupt that is to get you to hear the truth, but then to apply it in a way that becomes selfish and ambitious for personal gain. When it was never intended to be that. It's to show us who we are so that we can walk in the kingdom, to walk in his love, walk in his light, walk in his fellowship, and walk in his humility. Humility, in my opinion, is, is knowing and having confidence in who I am, so much so that it's no longer about me. I know who I am. So I can humble myself and spend my time, my attention, and my energy on loving you. That's the goal. And that's what humility does. It gets you to the point where you know who you are and you know that you are loved, and you know that you are strong, and you know that you are wanted, and you know that you are needed. So now it's no longer an issue. You can just turn your attention and your affection and your, your, your energy to making that known to everyone around you. That's our mission, and that's the humble love of God. So the scripture is James chapter 4, verse 6. And it starts out pretty strong. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I believe the church is coming to a place that we're going to start seeing things are not going to work like they used to work because God is no longer going to allow pride and arrogance into his people. He wants to now come in and remove that and replace it with genuine humility that looks just as confident as pride, but it's applied so vastly different. Pride says it's about me. Humility said it's about Jesus and what he's done for you. What he's done for me, I want to tell the world. So in Philippians chapter 3, and I'm going to read out of this a little bit, but I just want to look at verse 3. We are those who boast in what Jesus has done. You see the difference? Pride is spending a lot of time talking about everything I've done. But we are boasting in what Jesus Christ has done and not in what we can accomplish in our own strength. I think that's pretty powerful. Luke 18 the Lord brought me to this parable and just to try to illustrate what we're talking about, the difference between arrogance and pride, how God opposes that, and humility, how God embraces genuine humility. Jesus taught this parable to those who were convinced they were morally upright and those who trusted in their own virtue yet looked down on others with disgust. Now, let's stop for just a second. There's nothing wrong with feeling like you're the righteousness of God in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ, right? The problem is when my conclusion to that reality is I look down on you.
They looked at others with disgust. Two men who went into the temple to pray. One was a proud religious leader. The other was a despised tax collector. So let's look at the proud religious leader. In verse 11 and 12 of Luke 18, it reads, The religious leader stood apart from the others, because that's what pride does. I'm standing apart. I'm separating from you. Jesus got in a lot of trouble because he wouldn't separate himself from sinners. <laughs> you could find him with tax collectors and prostitutes. You could find him in those places where religious leaders said, don't go in there. Jesus said, why? Wherever I go, I bring light and love and joy and peace. So, he stood apart and he prayed, How I thank you, God, that I'm not wicked like everyone else. They're cheaters, swindlers, and crooks like that tax collector over there. God, you know that I never cheat or commit adultery. I fast food twice a week and I give you a tenth of all I earn. Now, again, anything that he's doing is pleasing to the Lord. God, God doesn't want me to cheat other people. He doesn't want me to be a crook. He doesn't want me to commit adultery, right? But again, you take those things and you start using them as a club against other people. God's not happy about that. That's pride. That's not love. And this guy felt like he was justified, you know, because everything he... See, here's the difference between pride and humility. He was justified because everything he thought he was doing. Instead of the reality, you're justified because you see everything Jesus has done for us. And never forget, it's what Jesus has done. He gives me the strength to live and walk a holy and righteous life. Then the humble, everybody say the humble tax collector. This is Luke 18, 13. The tax collector stood alone in a corner. Away from the holy place. Covered his face in his hands. Feeling he was unworthy even to look up to God. Beating his chest, he sobbed with brokenness and tears saying, God, please, in your mercy... Because of the blood sacrifice, forgive me, for I am nothing but the most miserable of all sinners. Mm, this is pretty extreme. I'm talking to believers today. You're not a miserable sinner. But pride would have you forget where you came from. Camilla ministered that so beautifully today. What we were. There's a scripture, I think, in Romans that said you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord. What I used to be, what I am now because of Jesus. But this tax collector was crying out for mercy, recognizing that he had nothing, that he was miserable, that he himself was a sinner. And in that humility and honesty, Jesus asked the question in verse 14, which one of them left for home that day reconciled to God? And then Jesus answered the question, the humble tax collector, not the religious leader. For everyone who praises himself will one day be publicly humiliated. And everyone who humbles himself will one day be publicly honored and lifted up. I want to be the one who humbles myself daily. Realize that anything and everything I have, anything and everything I've ever accomplished, all glory, all praise, all honor, and all credit goes to Jesus. Amen.
People have told me that I'm talented. And when I was younger and I was singing, it was embarrassing to me. I've told this story to a few of you. But when I was traveling with a TV group and singing, people would come up and say, oh, I love your voice. Much like you guys do all the time. Anyway, <laughs> I told Camilla, nobody ever says anything to me. But that's okay, because it used to bother me. But listen to this. Way back when I was young, um, these people would come, and I didn't, I didn't know how to handle it. And I would shrink back like, oh, no, you're going to ruin me. I don't want to get a big head and all of that. And I remember one of my friends who was older than I was, she came up to me and she said, I've noticed that when people say something to you, you, you get embarrassed. And she actually, what she, I remember this. Um, I went through a time uh, when I was a teenager, 18, 19, that if somebody said something to me, I would blush. And I mean, I would turn red, bright red. It was, it was kind of freaky, <laughs> like something was wrong with me. And she would say, I kind of noticed that you get embarrassed when people compliment you. She said, here's what you need to do. You need to accept that compliment as if it were a rose. Just receive it. Be gracious and humble. Thank you. But remember, you have an opportunity to collect that bouquet of roses and compliments and present it to Jesus. This is yours. Man, did that change my life. That simple encouragement helped me to realize that I could receive compliments, but I could walk in humility, recognize and give it all back to Jesus. Amen? Some of you have a hard time receiving compliments. I've complimented you, and you've cut me off. No, 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 don't. That's kind of carnal. Just say thank you and give the glory to Jesus. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So we know that the, well, let me read it again. Everyone who humbles himself will one day be publicly honored and lifted up. I'm going to read out of James chapter 4 and just ask the Holy Spirit to really touch our hearts. James was the pastor of the Jerusalem church. That means he was the one that God used to pastor Peter and Paul and the other disciples that were there and the apostles and the ones that were gathering in this what was called maybe the mother church. And James has a tremendous letter that he wrote. It's one of my favorite letters in the New Testament. But I want you to see the insight and the wisdom of James as he writes in chapter 4, starting in verse 1. What is the cause of your conflicts and quarrels with each other? Doesn't the battle begin inside of you as you fight to have your own way and fulfill your own desires? Let me tell you as your pastor, and a pastor that's been in this church for almost 15 years, that have seen hundreds of people come in and go out, Frustrated and aggravated because they didn't get what they wanted. I'm talking about good people that love God. But they wanted to do this. They wanted to do that. They wanted that. They wanted this. And they left like a child. I'm taking my toys and I'm leaving. So what's the cause of that? He answers it. You, you fighting to have your own way and fulfill your own desires. You know what humility means to a body of believers? It means that we humble and yield to say, Holy Spirit, have your way. And we trust the leaders that God's given us to follow the Holy Spirit. And when you don't think they are, pray. Pray for them. Don't criticize. Pray. You jealously, this is a real, talk about a pandemic in the church, is jealousy. You jealously want what others have, so you begin to see yourself as better than others. You scheme. Mm. I'm not a suspicious person. I see people talking, I'm not talking about present company. 
I see people gathering, and I feel the Holy Spirit sometimes just asking me to pray that their conversation would be led aright. You scheme and with envy and harm others to selfishly obtain what you crave. That's why you quarrel and fight. All the time you don't obtain what you want because you won't ask God for it. And then in verse 3, and, and even if you ask, you won't receive if you're asking with corrupt motives. What is the corrupt motive? What's in it for me? That's a corrupt motive. What am I going to be able to do? That's a corrupt motive. Can God get us to the point in humility that we are just excited to serve and let God do what he wants to do and use whom he wants to use? Isn't that a powerful concept? I want to say this. I'm thinking of it. I looked over at Don and Barb. I really love it when people take initiative. They hear from the Lord and they say, we would like to do this. Don and Barb brought a couple of weeks ago, they brought in a button that they had done for the clinic that they work at. And it was all about just an opportunity that says, need prayer. And we loved it, and they gave us some of them. And then Don came back and said, hey, what about us having one for Bethesda? I said, that'd be awesome. So Don and, Don and uh, Barb, and I think Justin helped out. They, they got it uh, arranged and designed. Before I knew it, Don walks in with, I don't know, a hundred of them. It says, this is for Bethesda. This is a tool that we can put on. And people look and say, what does that mean? It says, need prayer. Doesn't it say need prayer? Ask me. And it's, it's amazing. So those are on the desk in the foyer for you to take. For you to, if you want to, you can put it on a jacket or a hoodie or a T-shirt or something. Man, yesterday, Quentin, would have been a great opportunity out there we're not going to miss it next year. We're going we're to get it on the calendar because we're going to go out there with a tent, with our teams. We'll put on our button, and we're going to pray for people and love people. And our mission for that afternoon will not be to build Bethesda, but to build the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. To love people and tell them about Jesus. So I love it when you get ideas. I love it when you have, like Ford, a better idea. And when we're walking in unity and harmony, we can come together and we can create and build and do these things. But the problem that exists in the church is when there's jealousy and envy and strife and the motives are all messed up. And it all is pride and it needs to go. I want us to get so serious about it that we say I'm crucifying that part of the flesh in me. I don't want anything to do with it. You won't get what you ask because... Your motives are corrupt. You're seeking only to fulfill your own selfish desires. Verse 4, you have become spiritual adulterers who are having an affair, an unholy relationship with the world. Don't you know that flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God? See, the world tells you, look out for number one, do what makes you feel good. Take care of yourself. Man, this is creeping into the church in an ugly way. You do you. It's a me day. I got to take care of me now. That's so anti-Christian. You go to God and let him love on you. Let him fill you up. Let him comfort you. Let us pray with you. Bear one another's burdens. Care about one another. See, if the church was doing what the church was supposed to do, when we start feeling like that, instead of listening and flirting with the world and the way the world does it, we'd run right to the body and say, I know I'm going to get love there. I know I'm going to get prayed for there. I'm not going to be judged. They're going to love me. They're going to accept me with unconditional love. That's what the church is supposed to be. But when you go to the church and they go, well, you know, you probably deserve it. You know, you're kind of a compromiser. Holy Spirit's really good at convicting us. But the Bible says very clearly in Romans, there is therefore now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ. Conviction is very vastly different than condemnation. There's no place for condemnation. But we give room for the Holy Spirit. Even now we say, Holy Spirit, come 
Convict my heart. Convict our hearts so that there's no pride in us. We don't want pride. We want humility. James 4, verse 5. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? And this is really, this is something I almost passed over, and the Lord really highlighted this to me. The scriptures say that God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. I am not going to let pride pervert the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God in me. I was not created for sin. I was created for righteous peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen? So God is passionate to make sure the Holy Spirit in us is faithful to him. And he gives grace generously. As the scripture says, God opposes the proud. We started with this and gives grace to the humble. Now look at verse 7 and 8. And I'm going to close today with this because I have more. <laughs> But I'll close with this. So humble yourselves before God. I want to just, I underline this. Oh, good. It's, I underline it, and there's my notes. So humble yourselves before God. What does this look like, guys? It's not going to be the same for every person. And again, pride in me would make me judge you for the way I think you are or are not humble. I'll take my religious club and beat you to be humble. It's not going to happen. That's not God's way. The way is the Holy Spirit brings to us those areas of our life. He brings light. And then he gives us grace, generously giving us grace to change. Do you know what a synonym to the word change is? Repent. The word repent means to change your mind. I'm changing my mind about pride. I'm changing my mind about my title, my position, my ministry, my, my, my. I think it's the first word every child learns is mine. You're saying, say mama, daddy, mine. <laughs> That's the natural. But we're asking God to bring the super into our natural and give us the grace to say yours. To give us the, the humility of Jesus who humbled himself and he considered our interest above his own. So humble yourselves. What does that look like? I don't know. But I'm hoping that today the anointing of God will stir your hearts to take action. Some of us may get on our knees. Some of us may lay out on the floor. Some of us may just bow our heads. But it's a heart issue. Amen? It's a heart issue. And I want to give you just a moment. Everybody just close your eyes for just a moment. And you hearing me say this, but God needs to hear you say this. God, I humble myself before you. I humble myself before you. I acknowledge that you are my Lord. I acknowledge that I follow you. I acknowledge that you are perfect in all of your ways. I acknowledge that I can trust you. So I humble myself. And I ask you to forgive me when I take things into my own hands when I try to make things happen for myself, when I try to manipulate things so that I benefit, so I try to get recognized, I try to make sure I in, insert myself into the conversation. Well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. God, forgive me. Forgive us for pride. Help us to be genuinely humble because we know that we are Loved, accepted. So I humble myself. Hmm. I 
I want to read the next two sentences in these verses. It's interesting that humility will bring the victory. Humility will bring the victory. I said humility will bring the victory. Because the, after the period, humble yourself before God. That's what you can do. And then look what happens. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. What is the devil trying to do? He's trying to convince you. You got to stand up for yourself. You got to make sure they understand what you meant, what you said. You justify yourself. It's not fair. Exercise your rights. Resist the devil and the way that the prince of pride will try to get you to partner with his view. I resist that view. I'm humbling myself. I'm throwing myself into the care of God because I believe that when I humble myself, he will lift me up. This is how we fight our battles. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're humbling ourselves, and God is fighting the battle for us. Humility brings the victory. Resist the devil, he will flee. Look at verse 8. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Now, this scripture was written to believers. <laughs> and I, am for one, do not identify myself. My identity is not a sinner. I'm a believer. I'm a son. But what I'm asking the Holy Spirit to show me is that without a lack of humility, we reject the idea that we need to repent, that we need to humble ourselves because we're not perfect, that we all fall short and continue to make mistakes. Sometimes we willfully make mistakes, and sometimes we do it without realizing it. But when we're humble, we're not afraid to let Holy Spirit Bring us into the place of righteousness by confessing our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when I pick up next Sunday, I want to talk about what this means when, when James talked about us as sinners. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. This is the destination. No more division in my heart. I am all in to serve the Lord. As Joshua said way back when he was bringing the people into the land of promise, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. Wow. So again, this exhortation today I hope is an invitation for you to walk in greater victory, to walk in greater authority, to walk in a greater peace, a greater strength, have a better outlook. I want you to know that the foundation of what we're talking about, where we're going, God is laying the foundation of humility. He's going to empty out pride. I want to give testimony. Listen, a testimony that's full of pride is a testimony that just wants people to hear what you're doing. A testimony that's full of humility is a testimony that's all about what God is doing. There is a big difference. When we open up to give testimonies, we'll have people talking about what they're doing. I want you to get to the point where you are so partnered with the Holy Spirit and so sensitive in your heart to humility and how it pleases God, that you're going to say, I want to embrace this. I want God to see that I am walking as his, sold out to him, serving his purpose, really surrendering my will and saying, it's your will. I want what you want. It's not about me at all. Can somebody say amen? Amen. All right, so we're going to have a baptism. Anything you want to say, Camilla? All right, we're going to have a baptism, and I'm hoping, there's not that many of us, I'm hoping 
because of the time, we can all just kind of come out these doors and go right over here. So I'm going to just pray, dismiss those people that are watching online, and then just take a few minutes and meet us outside right here under the awning where we're going to have a baptism to anyone that wants to be baptized, but especially to celebrate Jim as he's baptized today. Amen. Father, thank you for an amazing day. Wow. Your presence in worship, the glory that's swirling around and hovering, the Holy Spirit that is so present. Jesus, you are among us. You are a humble king. You are a victorious, conquering champion. And we follow you. And we're pressing in to follow close. And as James encouraged, we want to come closer to you. We want to be as close to you as we possibly can be. <laughs> I want to be like John and just lean up and lean on you. Lean into you. We love you, Lord. That's, our, that's my heart is just to tell you over and over when I'm doing anything and everything, I love you. I live for you. In you, I live and move and have my being. So I just declare release health and healing and blessing and strength over all of your sons and daughters today. I thank you that we're washed in the blood of Jesus, that we're walking in the light, that there's no quarreling, there's no jealousy, there's no envy, there's no proud and selfish ambition. We're emptying it all out before you and we're giving it to you and you're filling us with your heart and with your love. We thank you for that. Amen. Thank you for watching today. We bless you for being a part of Bethesda. Come and see us whenever you can. We'll be right here Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. God bless you.